Hello and welcome to the MIT Open Documentary Lab talk. It's my great pleasure to welcome Mandy Rose. Uh, she is one of the key thinkers in the immersive and interactive documentary space, and it's wonderful to have her here today. She's going to talk about the ethics of VR documentary. She's a professor of documentary and digital cultures at the University of West England, Bristol, and also a co-convener of the IDOC Symposium, another important space for really grappling with the issues around documentary and emerging media, and also they, they exhibit work. Um, she's the co-investigator of the Virtual Realities Immersive Documentary Encounters multi-year research project that also asks key questions around documentary and emerging media. Um, you know, the, the impact, the audiences, and, and how it furthers the documentary mission. Um, before academia, she was um, at the BBC for 20 years, overseeing many award-winning, groundbreaking projects, uh, interactive and participatory, including Video Nation, which was one of the uh, key projects that uh, took participatory videos and put them, broadcast them, put them on the BBC, and it later became an online archive. Uh, she's um, a, a co-editor of the uh, book, The Evolving Practices of interactive documentary, and also a, a frequent writer about VR nonfiction. Um, before I hand it over to her, I just wanted to remind you to um, put your questions in the Q&A. Mandy will talk for about an hour, and then we'll have some responses and then questions from you. So without further ado, Mandy. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and so are you seeing my PowerPoint? Yep. Okay, that's great. So, so hi everyone. And thanks to Sarah, to William for the invitation to speak today um, and to Claudia for organizing the event. So, um, Ethics is central to documentary and has seen increasing attention within documentary studies in recent years. Documentarists engaging with VR encounter ethical issues common to documentary practice, as well as specific challenges which, we, which are multiplying in the context of rapid technological development and becoming more acute as VR converges with social media. In this lecture, I'll unpack some of these challenges arising for documentary in relation to VR and ask what a framework would look like that would support producers in thinking through the ethics in this area. This lecture is a rare opportunity to address an international group of practitioners and researchers in this field to speak to a collective challenge. I'm hoping that this talk will engender some new thinking about where we might go next in relation to the risks in this space. The lecture reflects research undertaken within the Virtual Realities Immersive Documentary Encounters, Encounters Project which was funded by the UK's EPSRC uh, Research Council, that's the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, within the Content Creation in the Digital Economy Program. Um, the project responded to a number of contexts. Um, the um, unexpected and decisive uptake of VR for nonfiction storytelling after 2014, challenges presented by VR to documentary ontology and epistemology, and the interdisciplinary nature of VR. Um, so here's the slide which shows our partners, the partner universities and our creative industry partners. So beginning in 2017, the two and a half year project brought, brought together three UK universities with creative industry and academic partners. And you will note MIT Open, Open Doc Lab among those partners. Um, and, and research fellow Dave Green was in residence here or there at MIT last autumn. And we welcome this chance to say thank you for your contribution to the project. So I'm gonna start with some headlines about the Virtual Realities Research Project before diving into questions of ethics. Um, here's the team, um, left to right, um, Professor Kirsten Cater, who's a um, computer scientist at the University of Bristol, who leads the project. To my right is Danai Stanton Fraser, a professor um, in human computer interaction at the University of Bath. 
three research fellows, Chris Bevan, Dave Green and Harry Farmer in respectively computer science, um, documentary studies and um, uh, experimental psychology. Um, and, and not here on the screen, but always plays a really crucial part in this project um, is Joe Gil Gildersleeve, the uh, administration administrative officer. Um, so we began with a number of research questions and this was the overarching question, very broad as you can see, how might the affordances of virtual reality for immersion and interaction take forward documentary's mission for storytelling about our shared world? Um, the program, um, uh, beneath it, there were a number of other questions. Um, we asked how spatial storytelling contributes to the work of witnessing the real, how presence contributes to a knowledge of the people and situations represented in VR, and how different vir virtual reality platforms mediate VR documentary experiences, thinking about sociality of social VR, isolation within the headset, etc. Um, the program of work has um, had a number of um, facets, as you can imagine, with that um, cross-disciplinary group of researchers. I'll just pick out some of the headlines. We began with a process that Chris Bevan led on of mapping the field through an online inter interactive mediography. Um, so this, this uh, looked at virtual reality uh, work that had been produced between um, 2012 and 2018 um, in the English language. Um, and uh, there are 600 plus um, projects uh, that are aggregated within the database. And you can kind of cut that information up different ways, looking at who the authors are, um, what the technology platforms are, um, what the length of, oh, how much content's been, been released, what the length of projects are, for example. Um, um, we've also undertaken a number of commissions. We commissioned three projects, which will also be the subject of case studies. Um, and we were looking for projects which we felt which would push the field forward by engaging specific challenges in practice. So there were three, as I say, um, Lisa Harewood and Ewan Cascavener um, worked on a project called Love and Seawater, a VR um, companion piece to a larger project that Lisa's been um, uh, developing for years called Barrel Stories, really important project that looks at the family separations that are involved in economic migration, particularly from the Caribbean to Britain, although it could map on any, onto any diaspora context, I think. Um, so Love and, in Love and Seawater, they asked, how might a co-creative process shape a VR work? And they worked with some older Afro-Caribbean people in a center in Bath, a city near, near to us in Bristol. Um, and they, you know, they had a dialogue with them over the content of the piece um, and try, you know, worked with, with their own memories, with the memories of people who were the carers of those elders who themselves had had, had these experiences of family separation um, and came up with a piece that I think in a really interesting way deployed two points of view, the point of view of a mother, the point of view of a child, um, tried to express, you know, dual points of view, something that VR hasn't done so much so far. Um, uh, second commission was um, Oscar Raby and Katie Morrison. Um, people will know their pioneering virtual reality work going back to Ascent, um, really a, a key piece in the earliest days of uh, VR documentary. And Oscar and Katie were interested in grappling with how you develop projects where the the interaction tells the story, as Oscar said, the mechanic is the message. How do you, how do you make pro projects where you're not just telling a story with interaction, you know, dipping in and out, that the interaction takes that, takes that story forward? Um, so they kind of dug into Unity to try and see how, how that development platform could support that work. And actually, it's not my subject now, but they hit some pretty serious uh, roadblocks in that process, um, which I think will make their case study super interesting. Um, so a third piece of um, the third commission is uh, Victoria Mapplebe Mapplebeck's work, Waiting Room VR. And this is a piece you may have seen. It's been, it was at Venice. It was at 
IDFA last November and won the Digital Storytelling Award there. And Victoria has always worked with her own personal archive as the content for her documentaries. And she was interested to see how she might do that in VR, how VR might be a space for, you know, a, a, a tradition of documentary making that goes a long way back, the kind of personal archival first person piece. Um, and I think, um, yeah, and I'll show you a clip from, from this piece. I start singing it. Yeah. I think it might come back to you. Every time we say goodbye, I sing a little. Every time we say goodbye. I remember the last time I gazed at an ultrasound screen, I was pregnant. The radiologist tells me there are two lumps. One may be a cyst. She will biopsy both. This is an audio presentation of Talking to Children When an Adult is Published in 2011, first edition. Recorded. Connection just slightly. Recorded there. Nobody should, you know, have to really think about their parents' mortality uh, when they're young. And I, I really, I think the worst thing for, for me in all of this has been that I didn't want you to have to, to have that in your life. Oh, don't give me a slow clap. What am I getting as... What are, yeah. I'm not that good at actress. I couldn't, I couldn't act crying, Jim. That's so brutal. You're so hard. start singing out. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, you'll notice from the end credit that it was East City Films. Um, Victoria worked with Darren, Darren, em Darren Emerson's company on, on that piece. And I think she made really bold use of 360 video. She, she uh, the piece is largely one uncut take. So you're in that very kind of claustrophobic space um, of the, of the, um, the hospital um, where she's having a scan. And then the, the family life enters in through this lovely kind of audio montage. Um, so, okay, so um, here's the household study. Uh, this was um, a major piece of re reception study work that we did within the project. Um, we gave um, Oculus um, goes to 12 households in Bristol, um, 12 diverse households, including 34 people. And we gave them a program of 46 non-fiction VR uh, works to, to, to watch across eight weeks. Um, they presented this project at MIT last autumn and, um, and you know, we've been kind of working on the analysis and we've got an article coming out shortly. Um, the household framing allowed us to gain a kind of a, a really valuable insight into how people responded to the content, but also to the medium of VR. Um, they had lots that was positive to say about how VR supports nonfiction in particular, but they also had some very significant reservations. Um, and I'll be coming back to some of those shortly. Um, so just some, some, of our, some of our written outputs, you probably won't be able to take that in. I'll, I'll, I'll go forward from there. Um, so, so, oh yeah, we've published obviously in academic journals, but also a number of articles on Immerse News and hope to follow up with some more as other, as other uh, uh, peer-reviewed articles um, emerge too. So um, our final sort of sub-question uh, was about ethics. What are the ethical implications of virtual encounters with images of real people and places? Um, and we, we kind of start, we started thinking about that quite late in the project last autumn. Um, and in a sense, it's still a work in progress. Last autumn, we convened an interdisciplinary workshop in the council room at BBC Broadcasting House in London, bringing together producers, researchers, innovation people to discuss v VR documentary ethics because we, and we wanted to make a practical intervention in the field. Um, 
here's everyone who joined us that day. So thanks to them uh, as well, because their contribution informs my presentation now. Um, so I'll begin talking about ethics with a quote from um, a 2009 report produced by Pat Aufderheide and associates, um, which came out of a, a review of um, documentary practice in, in the US. Um, and, you know, it's a stark and interesting fact that there is no such thing as a shared field-wide set of ethical standards within documentary. Um, you know, why? <laughs> documentary has been a, you know, uh, a plural, diverse activity, often produced by independents um, rather than people in, um, in, in um, media organizations. Um, it's, it's, there is no governing body. Uh, there is no um, certification for documentary producers. And, in, and, and, and to a large extent, I think probably many of us welcome that situation. Um, guidelines do exist in some specific contexts, for example, uh, some commission, um, some broadcasters have their own guidelines. When I was working at the BBC, that BBC's producer guidelines were a kind of key point of reference, not just on ethics, but on all your activities as a BBC producer. Um, and this situation contrasts strongly with journalism, which kind of rooted in the newsroom has long established um, ethical frameworks. And I was super, in, super aware when I watched Nonny talking a couple of weeks ago, that, um, that she, as a journalist, she was very clear in drawing on a set of principles that informed her work. Um, so, um, oh, hang on, not quite there. So, um, in, a, um, in a 2014 chapter, Pat Afterhide, who, uh, who I'm citing here, followed up her work on the 2009 report by surveying ethical challenges arising for documentary in the context of the web, transmedia, and interactive. She asked how documentarists maintain good faith in the context of online work. Um, and while she identified opportunities for ethical behaviors that online platforms and the read-write technology of the web afford, um, participatory potentials, for example, after Hyde concluded that interactivity multiplies the ethical challenges. Um, it was around 2014 when she wrote that chapter that VR emerged from the lab into the mainstream with the Oculus platform being launched. Um, and that emergence came with what I've called elsewhere, hype and hope. Um, the hope um, was derived from research work and here uh, reviewed in this article, which I think was 2016, meant to check. Um, here reviewed by Mel Slater and Maria Sanchez Vives from the event lab in Barcelona. The hope was derived from, from evidence, um, research-based evidence of VR's potential benefits for applications, including therapy, education, and training. The hype emerged in particular in relation to VR documentary and claims that the VR platform uh, offers unquestionable benefits to society through its ability to foster empathy. Um, I meant to grab a quote from Chris Milk here, but, um, and I seem to have not done that, but I think um, probably most of you are familiar with his talk. And I think if you're not, you should, you should watch it. It's readily available, um, in which he made a very clear link between, um, between VR and empathy. Um, um, so, and much has been said about it. It's, you know, argued and discussed. Um, but, it, but I think there's no doubt that it's, that it's argument, which is a kind of techno-determinist argument, an argument founded in the idea that this technology will deliver an effect, um, that this idea continues to influence the field. I, I, I continue to be taken aback by you know, coming across people having conversations where people talk about VR and empathy in the same breath, as if there is a clear and simple link between the two, and as if empathy is a self-evident priority for documentary. Um, so here we see um, uh, Facebook harnessing the idea of VR media as an engine for positive change in the very name of its non-fiction initiative, VR for Good Creators Lab, leveraging VR and 360 film to drive meaningful social change. Um, 
you know, in the last few years, we've learned a lot about the ambiguity of the web as a platform, the surveillance capitalism underlying its democratizing and network potential, its amplification of extremes, challenges to individual autonomy and to democracy. Um, utopian hopes for the web have been dashed, but these don't go, these didn't go away. They simply migrated to VR. And um, this is, I'm afraid, my only joke, which is, you know, what I call the whack-a-mole theory of techno-utopianism, the idea that it diminishes in one space only to pop up somewhere else. Um, you know, I would say, I, you know, I'd like to say there have been terrific VR documentaries, projects that deploy the immersive and experiential affordances of VR for critical, rigorous, and at times playful work that calls on the viewer to reflect, to question their relationship to historical reality. Um, and I will name some projects, projects including Ascent, Common Ground, Traveling Wild Black, Greenland melting, Bidarban first light. So insofar as ethics is about individual and collective good, these are ethical works in my opinion. But in the sense that they recognize power, privilege as historically specific, contested and in flux, they are also political works. Um, but meanwhile, despite, and as I say, a body of really interesting good work appearing, um, assumptions and claims about VR's positive benefits have left wider ethical issues and risks of VR, under, uh, VR documentary under-examined. Um, so um, this is the work of the lecture, to, uh, this lecture to unpack these issues of concern. Um, so scholars, documentary scholars, including Brian Winston and Michael Renov, have conceptualized social documentary as a relational practice that unfolds within a triad of producer, subject, and audience. I'm gonna use that model to think through issues of eth ethics here. Um, VR documentaries invo in involve common ethical, uh, ethical challenges that are common to, to other forms of documentary, but also specifics that arise in relation to VR. Meanwhile, it's important as William Arricchio has urged us to do, to remember that VR isn't a single platform, um, rather it's a variety of capture technologies, platforms and user experiences, 360 video, CGI, with exhibition models that are app-based, location-based, static, room scale, and it can also involve peripherals engaging multiple senses. So let's take um, the first axis of this uh, triad of relationships. Think about the producer and subject. Here, in regular, traditional, perhaps we might say linear documentary, we'd be thinking about how the power relationship is negotiated at the heart of documentary. What does it mean, you know, what does informed consent look like? Are, are participants aware of possible consequences of taking part? It's about the editorial. Who decides what story gets told? Does the subject have any recourse to shape the content? It's about economic and reputational value. Who benefits from media making? So if we think about the producer subject now in relation to VR documentary ethics, um, uh, new questions also emerge. If this is unfamiliar technology, there's a question of legibility. Does the subject actually understand what the technology does um, and how they will appear within it? Um, thinking about um, capture technologies, for example, 360 video. Do the subjects of a 360 video know when the, what the camera is or when it's running? Um, thinking about exhibition, will the people who are in, the, in, this, in this project even see the finished product? Will their friends and family be able to see it? Um, and then we might think on the production side, um, what's the profile of those telling the story? Do they have an informed, nuanced sense of the world and issues that they're depicting? Um, and, you know, one might point to challenges around diversity in the VR industry, issues relating to gender, for example, in the profile of the sector. And there's work, work being done in this area, for example, um, 2018's A Vision for Women and Virtual Reality, Alan Atkinson, Kennedy et al. Um, so moving on to producer and audience. Here, 
in linear documentary, we'll be asking, um, how is the content framed? What's the implicit contract between the producer and the audience? We'll be thinking about rhetoric. How does the content make its case? Affect, how does it make the viewer feel? And veracity, what claims are made or implied about the relationship of the work to historical reality? Whose perspectives are included? So when we think about those questions in relation to VR documentary ethics, we have to ask, how is this changed by the unique user experience of VR? Uh, this kind of solitary, hermetic nature of VR reception. What difference does that make? or does immersion make to audience experience? Um, and I would suggest that, you know, audience experience is, is profoundly transformed um, uh, as the audience member becomes a solitary user. Um, participants in our, in our reception study had a lot to say about this. They saw VR as, as deeply at odds with the sociality of the home. And they were concerned too about what difference immersion made to their response to the content. They pointed out VR's potential for persuasiveness, were concerned about its uses for propaganda. Um, I suppose one said, actually, I trusted the content in the VR more because I was in it. So I think it could be really persuasive. Another said, it's so realistic, you end up thinking, well, that's how it is, because I saw it with my own eyes. Um, they noted too that their awareness of how of the of the directorial input, the direct directorial shaping of the material uh, disappeared in the seamless environment of VR. One said, you feel like you've been somewhere and you feel like you know about it, but actually you just know one person, one filmmaker's perspective. Um, so if we uh, move on to thinking about the third part of this triad, subject and audience. We might ask, um, what does it mean? You know, this is all about, you know, thinking about the, the relationship of the audience to the subject. What does it mean to witness the life of another through media? What's the contract um, implied or implicit contract between subject and audience? And what does the subject hope for from the audience in taking part? Um, in this space, um, I mean, this is the area in which there's been the mo most um, critical work uh, and some really interesting work um, uh, uh, in arts and humanities. Um, starting, I'd suggest, with um, Kate Nash's 2017 paper, The Ethics of Immer Immersive Witness, um, in which Kate situated the kind of experience of witness in VR in, in terms of a kind of lineage of documentary witness and, and discussed um, this kind of idea of the kind of inappropriateness of the, the feeling of closeness that you have in VR, this feeling of being alongside someone. And she, 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 she borrowed from Lily Chuliariki this idea of improper distance. The idea there being that, you know, you have this sense of closeness, you feel, you know, in some sense, and perhaps empathy, sympathy, compassion with the other in VR, but actually you're forgetting who you are and your distance from that person. And those are, those are appropriate ethical stances for somebody experiencing a documentary. Um, so um, in 2020, um, I think it's 2019 actually, anyway, forgive me, Lisa Nakamuri published a, a brilliant, a blistering critique of virtual idea, a virtual reality, and the idea of the empathy machine. Um, she, she, taught, she, she critiqued the idea that VR can immerse the user in the lives of others, usually people of color, children, prisoners, transgender people, as an effective cure for callousness. Um, you know, she suggested that the problems here are not problems of ethics, but problems of politics, um, and that, and that these, um, this idea of empathy sidesteps the urgent structural problems that are embedded in, su in some of the worlds being depicted. Um, so so um, uh, I'm gonna just take a, a moment for a little autoethnography. Um, 
an example of my own experience as audience of one immersive piece. Um, the piece is Immersive Histories, Dam Busters, produced by a UK company, All Seeing Eye, in 2018, developed with historical consultation from the Imperial War Museums. Um, it is, and this is quoting the website, an accurate portrayal of events of Operation Chastise, placing audiences in the position of the wireless operator on board G. George, the first aircraft to attack the Moam Dam. Um, so, um, uh, at, uh, and I'll just describe this scenario. Sitting within a physical set of the Lancaster bomber interior, audiences are immersed with virtual reality visuals, spatialized audio and haptic feedback, successfully capturing a sense of what it may have been like to experience the historical, historical event firsthand. So as a 20 year old flight engineer, my father flew 34 raids in Lancaster bombers into Germany in 1944. We hardly talked about it. And of course, after he died, I wished that we had. So I was curious to try this piece. This piece. Um, and I've got a clip from the piece, um, which I'll start to play. Um, I don't want to call the aircraft. I'm going to attack. To be controlled by the engineer. So on a flat screen, this is nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing to me. It doesn't kind of move me. But ensconced in the headset and the haptic jacket, as soon as the flap from the anti-aircraft gunners started, I was overwhelmed, a weeping wreck, overcome by an idea of how scary it must have been for my father up there on one after another of these dangerous missions. Of course, I have no idea what he felt, really. These were my feelings, my projection. Um, but the power of my emotional reaction, which was completely unanticipated, has left me wary about what informed consent means in these experiences. Um, what might an ethics of care look like when we're inviting someone to take part? I'm really not sure. And there's another point I'd like to make too about this piece. Um, Dan Buster's VR is on display at the RAF Museum in London, inviting visitors one after another to imagine the airmen's point of view. But what about the experience of the people on the ground? What about their fears and their fate? 50 years after World War II, is this how we want to do history of this period? Might a historical perspective that transcends a visceral national point of view be more productive, generative? of um, a sense of the complexity of that history. Um, so I would suggest that VR's value in providing virtual situated experience comes at a cost to, doc to documentary's historical role, historic role in offering multiple points of view, what Michael Shannon has called its, um, its unique role in the public sphere. Um, I'm just going to check my clock. Okay, sure. Um, so part three, uh, changing your mind. I'm going to pivot now to consider issues of ethics in VR as articulated by um, researchers in psychology, neuroscience, philosophy of mind. While documentarists have engaged the power, have engaged rhetoric, um, to metaphorically change the minds of viewers. These perspectives ask us, ask us to consider um, how the experiment, experiential nature of VR might impact users psychologically, literally changing minds. Um, in early 2016, Michael Madry and Thomas Metzinger, philosophers of mind at University of Mainz um, in Germany, published an invaluable overview of ethical challenges looking across research contexts and personal uses of VR. They came up with recommendations for minimizing the risks they see as associated with the platform. Um, so their concerns arise from the powerful sense of presence that we experience in VR and from that the sense of VR as an alternate environment. Um, 
they they you know they they stress the sensitivity um, people's sensitivity to environmental factors and the plasticity of the human mind, um, and they uh, and the psychological realism that is involved in these VR pieces. Um, they they cite in terms of kind of our sensitivity to environmental factors. They cite a number of kind of research studies. Um, including kind of notorious ones like the Stanford Prison Experiment in 1974, um, in which volunteers playing prison guards began to adopt kind of domineering and bullying behaviors simply through playing the role. Um, but also they, 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 they mentioned the coffee drinkers uh, experiment in 2006, um, in which researchers in a university lab in Newcastle were found to contribute more to the to the, um, the coffee fund when they were watched by a pair of eyes on an A5 poster above the coffee machine setup. Um, so yeah, so this is this is the context of Madri and Metzinger's concerns. This, this, this the issue of VR as a as a as an alternate environment. Um, and they they're concerned in that context with lasting psychological effects, how changes in behavior might carry from VR might carry over into a non-virtual state and they're concerned with manipulation. Um, they identify four areas of risk. Um, the long risk of long-term, psychological risk of long-term immersion, the danger of neglect, neglecting your um, uh, physical environment for the virtual environment. And then the final two, which I think are of urgent concern for documentary, this idea of risky content and hazards related to privacy. Um, in 2020, um, Metzinger um, has come up with, you know, has kind of revisited some of those concerns and added new ones, in particular, this concern with what he calls technological confluence. Here we here he's talking about, you know, two technologies added together, VR and AI, social VR and photorealism. VR plus deep fakes. So, um, you know, Metzinger's pointing to the rapid speed of developments in this area and the kind of multiplying concerns where these technologies get added together. Concerns around, um, you know, if you're if you think about psychological realism, concerns around the, um, you know, amplification of those of those problems. Um, so, and here just uh, an example um, of a, you know, something on YouTube at the moment, which is Facebook's research into photorealistic photo face tracked avatars. Um, so these technologies for kind of photorealism that will be uh, part of a VR experience are advancing um, rapidly. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> so um, I've got, okay, keep going. Um, so, in a recent article, The Ethics of Realism in Virtual and Augmented Reality, uh, Mel Slater um, and Associates write, it is expected that physical superrealism in XR systems achieved through advances in computer graphics, um, uh, enabling more photographic realism, improvements in sensory feedback and the possibility to interact with virtual elements also increase psychological realism. Um, and meanwhile, Haggard, Patrick Haggard, a, a neuroscientist, ha has also contributed recently to this debate um, with his concern around VR as a technology which is fundamentally an experience generator. Um, Haggard's concerns kind of follow two lines. One is relating to autonomy and, and free will. Um, but he also asks about personalized and responsive VR environments um, and how these square with what he calls, drawing on Hannah Arant's writing, the duty of facing reality. So there's this idea that, you know, as environments increasingly become responsive, well, there's an idea or rather a question about where our common, where the common space, where the common space lies how we, you know, and, and the problem that I think we're all aware of at the moment with around disinformation, misinformation, that problem of 
the shared sense of reality, or as Arendt would put it, the duty of facing reality. Um, and Haggard's particularly concerned with um, how VR deals with the autobiographical experiences of the user when they are being reactivated. He points to research on false memory and, the, and how easy it is, how easy it can be to introduce memories which people begin to feel are their own. Um, so, yep. So um, moving from risky, um, risky content to data and privacy. Um, this is an image from a, a slide deck by a PlayStation executive which celebrates the value of biometric data within, within gaming, these, um, yeah. So, so data that can be captured in VR allows a responsiveness that is key to, apply, to VR's applications, to psychological assessment, to training, um, as, as well as, for example, gaming, um, where it's becoming increasingly important. Gaze data, facial tracking capable of passing micro expressions with potential for full body data. This is a rich seam of information reflecting the conscious and unconscious priorities, choices and preoccupations of users. Where VR platforms are owned by technology companies, there is much that's unknown about the capture, storage and sharing of this information. Um, and you know, given the richness and visceral nature of data, data that can be captured within VR environments. This is, a, this is a new ethical frontier for documentary with producers needing to learn about and take responsibility for user privacy within their projects. Um, this issue um, of Facebook, sorry, Facebook, I've, 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 yeah, sorry, I've missed a few slides, but anyway, this issue of Facebook's interest in VR is now magnified with their announcement that as from October, it's mandatory for new Oculus users to log in via a Facebook account. This has profound implications as user, user data from across these sites converge um, from across you know, social media and um, other kind of VR activities as well as within Facebook's own social uh, VR platform horizon. So here we can see a potential for instant recognition of an individual um, through this accumulation of data, as well as an exponential increase in power, in the power of, of data that's combined when used at scale. So, and this is in a context where Oculus is the dominant platform in VR documentaries. As I said, we used Oculus Goes in our recent research as well. So if we think of this producer subject audience triad within documentary, um, uh, we need to recognize, I think now the platform as a fourth party in that relationship. Um, VR documentary ethics have to start from that recognition. So um, this is my final section towards a framework. Um, and I'm just starting with a, with a, um, you know, a, a description of what we might be seeking in terms of ethical governance, um, an approach that seeks to deal with ethics, um, ethical issues before they arise in a principled manner, rather than waiting until a problem surfaces and dealing with it in an ad hoc way. Um, so this is what we, this is what we, what we, what we need, what we want, what we'd like to be developing towards. Um, and uh, Mel Slater um, and associates are, you know, underlining um, the case that um, while VR has mostly been, while XR has mostly been confined to the lab, the clinic and the training institution, these issues could be considered as worthy of academic and business discussion. Now that XR is about to become a tool widely used in society, they may become pressing problems. Um, so um, we, um, from, our research, from our research and the London works I mentioned before, we've drawn out a list of questions. These address themes including accessibility, diversity, data and privacy, cultural appropriation, um, risky content, um, in groups and out groups, and more. Um, there are other themes we want to include, 
environmental impact, for instance, particularly in relation to AI. So we're, see, we're looking at potentially, you know, a set of 100 questions um, uh, by the time we've worked through all these themes. Um, and we've organized them according to um, moments within the production process. So you can see here some questions around platform politics addressed to the producer at the moment when they're beginning a new project, when they're in or when they're kind of in pre-production. So asking that people really consider which platform they're going to use. Um, so, um, so, you know, our questions are a start, but they're by no means an answer. Um, not least, there's the issue about the, the, the rapid nature of, of change of technological developments. How can a framework be agile enough to respond to that pace of change? Um, so in conclusion, um, oh, uh, okay, in conclusion, um, I'd suggest that VR amplifies and multiplies the challenges of traditional documentary. Um, that producers are operating in what Metzinger calls the pacing gap between innovation, regulation, and policy. Um, there's no doubt that an interdisciplinary approach is required here, and an attention to the ethics, but also to the politics of VR documentary. And finally, I'd suggest in this space that that, 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 that VR, that documentary's triad needs to give way to a tetrad. Um, in which we are always asked to, for a critical response to platform politics. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, yeah, I will go, okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mandy. That's such critical research, wow. Um, we have asked Kent Bai uh, to be a respondent um, today. Uh, Kent, many of you probably know him for his uh, Voices of VR podcast. If you don't, I highly recommend you check that out. It's a treasure of information and thinking. Um, but he's also been working in the epics um, in XR space and not just documentary, but across XR and many different fields, medical entertainment. Um, but he's going to give a response today. We'll also have some responses from our fellows, and then we will take your questions. So, Kent, why don't you take it from here? Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Andy, that was a, a great talk of uh, really diving into a lot of the different issues coming from the lens of documentary. Um, and my first uh, comment is that what's happening in the overall VR space is this interdisciplinary fusion that's happening. Uh, and so just as an example, like as we wear VR headsets, then you're going to be able to have access to biometric data. So like the platform, either the creator or the platform provider. So there's this kind of blurring of lines of existing context. And as those lines get blurred of those previous contexts, then that's where all these ethical dilemmas start to come up. And so we've had um, just in general, this movement of all technology that's dissolving our, our existing contextual boundaries, VR is just the next iteration. And so uh, it was probably back in 2000 and, uh, 2016, that was when the Upload uh, VR wrote an article saying that there was, Facebook was sending back information back that they weren't disclosing. And, and so then they did an article about it, got the attention of Senator Al Franken at the time, and he wrote a letter to Facebook asking, okay, what's going on here with privacy? And so it was then that when I went to the Silicon Valley Virtual Reality Conference, um, just after that, a few weeks later, um, where people within the VR industry were starting to talk about privacy and ethics. And it's been since then where uh, I've been just listening, going to these conferences and seeing what the zeitgeist and what the discussion has been. And, and since that time, it's been an ongoing discussion. It's only gotten more and more of a concern. So since that point, I've done probably around 40 plus different interviews uh, panel discussion, keynote talks, looking at this issue of XR ethics, um, helped to coordinate the VR Privacy Summit in 2018 at Stanford University with Jeremy Balenson and um, Phil Rosedale and Jessica Outlaw. So we brought together uh, 50 different people with Chatham House Rules to talk about the issues of privacy. And I left that meeting 
realizing that number one, there's not a comprehensive like philosophical framework for privacy. <laughs> and that number two, none of these companies have any clue about what their philosophy of privacy is. They're just following what the law has been. So the philosophy of privacy, all these companies or whatever was written back in like 1973, <laughs> which was the fair information practice principles, which set forth the boundaries under which that you can do pretty much anything you want as long as you declare it. And it's regulated by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, saying that as long as you declare it, and if you, if you don't declare it and you do something that you're, you haven't declared, then it's sort of like false advertising. And that's sort of how privacy is con like looked at in the United States. Um, so there's been discussions around a federal privacy law where uh, we need to have, like in the United States, you know, in the European Union, there's the GDPR, which has got this privacy as a human right. It's like has a very strong viewpoint. And <clears throat> there's this other and I'm just trying to give like a, a larger sort of context as to what's happening in the, in the privacy space because it's coming up here within the platform politics and everything you're talking about. And I think the, the front lines of that battle right now have to do with, um, is there gonna be enough political will and philosophical insight to declare privacy as a human right in the United States? And it's unlikely that's gonna happen. What's probably gonna happen is that it's more of a sort of a libertarian approach of like, you can continue to um, give away your privacy uh, in exchange for access to services. And so it's sort of like seen as this, you're paying with your data type of mindset. Um, so this is, I think, um, the, the issues that you are talking about here, the platform politics issues, it's like this global geopolitics issue that has to do with um, the unregulated uh, issues of antitrust with these big major tech com companies where there's essentially like five or six major tech companies that can do whatever they want because they've been killing, they've been either acquiring, killing or copying the competition for so long that there's just a vacuum of alternatives to be able to actually compete at this scale of consumer technology. So, <laughs> so I wanted to just say that, uh, that all of this discussion that you're talking about, the platform politics sort of gets into a lot of stuff that I've been talking about, but I just want to sort of introduce some of that. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to take a step back um, and just say that for the perspective of ethics in general, what I see is that there's going to be medical ethics, there's going to be documentary ethics, there's going to be game ethics, and that there is right now a discussion that's happening amongst all of these different disciplines to say, like uh, ther like therapists who like there's ethics for therapy. Well, you can start to do therapy over XR. So what does that mean for what the ethical principles of therapy are going to be applied to to VR in that context, but also in every context because now all of a sudden you're essentially giving experiences that can have therapeutic impacts on people. So what's that mean for documentary filmmakers to produce pieces that actually give therapeutic impact? So again, you're sort of blurring together what would normally be a uh, <laughs> uh, something that would be like going to a counselor, uh, but now all of a sudden those ethical frameworks from counseling is now being applied to media creation. And I think that is the thing that I'm seeing within XR is that it's like all these different disciplines and all these perspectives of these ethical frameworks. Um, and the challenge is how do you create a philosophical framework that describes the entirety of the human experience? <laughs> and so <laughs> that's like, uh, mathematically, Gödel came up with this sort of incompleteness, which essentially says that it's impossible to sort of create a consistent model that maps everything. Whatever model you are going to do, it's going to be incomplete. And so even ethics has been dealing with this because there's different ethical frameworks of like virtue ethics or deontological ethics or, um, you know, uh, consequentialism. So each of these ethical frameworks have a lens into reality. And they're going to sh reveal something that have these different inherent trade-offs, but there's going to be things that are missing. And so as I'm listening to your talk, I see that the challenge of um, you're sort of going through and you're listing all these different aspects and areas where you're kind of doing this um, lens shift for now we're going to talk about the power relationship. Well, the power relationship is sort of different from some of these other aspects of the relationship between the audience because it's just a different context that's there. And so I guess as I've been looking at this as an issue, um, it's like, what is the philosophical framework to make sense of it so that you could have a framework that is able to look at any context, it being context independent, and for you to start to uh, be able to make judgments that allow you to negotiate these inherent 
trade-offs and these dialectics within each of these different domains. Um, and so that's part of the work that I've been doing. Um, and uh, you, you showed just a brief uh, slide there at the end, which was sort of the early phase of the uh, XR ethical framework that I've been working on. Um, and then I did a whole eth XR ethics manifesto uh, in October of last year after doing like a series of different keynote talks and panel discussions at SIGGRAPH and just like trying, because what is happening is that no one individual can come up with a comprehensive framework. You have to come up with like each of the stakeholders and all these different perspectives. And that's like at a meta level, that's what's happening in the industry, which is like trying to bring together all these different perspectives. And so um, after I did my XR ethics manifesto, I've since been looking at, you know, the frontiers of what the federal privacy law in the United States is going to be. But there's also an initiative from the IEEE that is going to be launching here within the next couple of weeks or month or so. Um, so there's an ethically aligned design approach from the IEEE, and they did this whole industry connection survey of the ethics of AI. Uh, and in that context of ethics of AI, they had like one chapter about XR because they saw that XR is going to be a distribution a, a platform for AI technologies. But then they were like, this is actually like a whole realm within itself uh, of just XR ethics where, you know, again, bringing together all these different academics and industry players to be able to start to come up with a very similar kind of white paper approach. And so that is going to be starting up here within the next couple of months. And I'm involved with that. And I'm, I guess I'm mentioning it here before it's been like officially announced, just because I think the people that are in this call right now are going to be the type of people that are going to be needed to come in and provide your perspective of what it means to look at the uh, perspective from documentary. The, the thing that's unique about documentary is there's actually a subject. Uh, there's the producer and the subject. So when I look at the typical, the, the, I sort of have a, a four-legged uh, approach when I think about XR. There's the XR technologies. Then there's the affordances of that technology that producers come in and, and exploit the full potential of that technology. And then there's the distribution platform to get that technology into people's hands. And then there's the audience that watch it. And you really need to have that full feedback, like, well, feedback loop cycle in order to get full uh, you know, development of a medium. Uh, so you introducing the distribution platform, I think is apt because I do think that's a key part. And the thing that's unique from the documentary is that there's the subject. So you're, you're covering people's lives, which I think, you know, normally you're just doing CGI games or whatnot, doesn't have a subject always. Um, it's not like a universal that there's always going to be a subject, but in this case, you are taking in someone else's life and then you're sort of recontextualizing in this immersive media. Uh, so a few more thoughts, uh, just because um, we are in the early phases of VR. VR is so nascent and early that it's not at a critical mass, that it's really on the attention of sort of more adversarial mindsets. Like as an example, Facebook uh, and Twitter are so big, Facebook especially, that's like you know over 3 billion people that it becomes a target for national security, like states, like state actors who are you know, using it as a weaponized platform for information warfare. VR is not at the point of getting on anybody's radar for being a platform for we like <laughs> weaponizing experiential technologies, uh, but it will if it continues to grow. And I think that we're in this kind of unique bubble, which I kind of refer to as the cinema attractions phase of VR, which is like everybody that's involved with it is just really has like perfect, <laughs> like good intentions that they're not deliberately trying to like manipulate or control massive amounts of people. But as VR continues to grow and evolve, that will, will start to happen because we are already in a adversarial relationship when it comes to information online. So these underlying questions of epistemology and truth and how do you know what is real and what is not real, we're already dealing with like fake news and you know ways of manipulating and controlling uh, you know, deep fakes and all this stuff. And that is only going to get even more uh, intense once people realize the transformative power of being able to have an immersive story that could be uh, produced with the intention to shift culture. Uh, and how do you create the resilience uh, within the audience to have the media literacy to be able to discern whether or not, like, how do you take in this information and how does that impact your individual sense of what is truth and what is reality and your sense of your epistemology. Um, so that, that's just sort of like some high level thoughts. I mean, 
you know, my, the framework that I've uh, gone through, I, I have an experiential design framework where I look at the quality of the experience, the context of the experience, the character of the experience and the story of the experience. And I think as you talk about this, there's the story aspect, which is like, what is the actual story that you're trying to tell? There's the character, which sort of gets to get into both the character of, of the uh, people that you're covering, but there's also some of these different power dynamics that you could start to say are kind of maybe at that virtue ethics level uh, where you're looking at different power relationships. Uh, and then there's the context, which um, Helen Niesenbaum has the whole framework called contextual integrity. And so contextual integrity approach to privacy is all about like, it's so context dependent uh, because like when you go to a doctor, you can tell a doctor a piece of information that you wouldn't tell, you know, a stranger, or you would go into a bank and listen to your accountant and you were telling them financial information that would normally be private. So there's not like a universal rule that you would never tell this piece of information to anyone ever. It's contextual, it's context dependent. And so, you know, with this approach of contextual integrity, uh, my sort of mapping of the different contexts of VR is, is actually the, the context of the human experience that is sort of independent of VR. So what are the domains of the human experience and what are those different contexts that are kind of universal to documentary filmmaking, but there could be specific topics that you're covering. So, you know, if you're like a good example that comes up here is people who are homeless. When you go into someone who is uh, a homeless encampment, you're essentially recording, it's, you're, you're in a kind of semi-public space, but you're recording someone's private home. So what are the ethics around you just going into somebody's home and recording everything around you? There's a lot of privacy implications there. And there, there tends to be like this uh, tricky line of what is the ethics around like even capturing somebody's space and how much control they have over it. And then, you know, um, there's other decolonized sort of implications of like going into someone's life and sort of uh, seizing their story, and then you could take control of that. And then, what is the the relational dynamics between who owns the story and who get and whether or not the people that you're capturing that story, if they are able to be in direct relationship to how that story gets told? Because mm -hmm. as storytellers, uh, there's like this sort of arrogance that oh, we know how to tell your story better than you do. But <laughs> I think there's an aspect of like, is can that be a collaborative process, and what does that actually look like? Uh, and then the final aspect of the quality of the experiences are kind of like the uh, different levels of presence and your direct phenomenological experience of VR and all the different psychological impacts that can happen with the medium itself. And start, starting to sort of pull in together all that sort of neuroscience and psychological research and you know where the risks and the harms uh, as you go into that. So uh, for me, at least, I start to break down these issues into the quality, context, character, and story. And so as I listen to your talk here, I see that you're kind of pulling in each of these different dimensions, uh, but it's sort of like um, just naming the problems uh, without understanding uh, or without sort of putting it into a meta ethics framework that's like uh, and capturing the inherent sort of uh, dialectics or trade-offs that you have each in, within each of these different contexts. Because I think that's a challenge. You're like, okay, here's all the different things we know, but how do you actually make decisions based upon you know, given this, here's the trade-off to that. So I think it's probably a good start, uh, place to stop. But as I watch that, that's sort of things that start to come up. And, um, you know, it's great to, uh, for me at least, to sort of be working in this field of ethics and uh, to see someone coming from completely from a different discipline and domain and to, to have new information that I haven't seen before, but also to kind of repeat a lot of the same issues that I think are coming up across the XR industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> so much, Kent. Um, this is just the, the tip of the iceberg of this conversation today. There's so much work to be done. Um, and in the spirit of how we run these uh, sessions, I'm going to open up to other questions unless you want to respond quickly, Mandy, um, because there are many questions from our audience and I think some of our fellows. Let's too pick up a few of those and we, you know, it'll, there'll be a dialogue between that, no doubt, and what Kent's just said. So, yeah. Okay. William, you look like you want to talk. Sure. <laughs> Mandy, thank you so much. And, and, and Kent, uh, thank you both. And the project sounds terrific. I, I want to kind of frame what I heard and then focus in on a, on a question. And the frame is there's a lot of concerns and you and you not you you put it well that are kind of coming over from you know traditional documentary ethics concerns having to do with the, the categories you listed. Makes sense. Then there's a set of concerns around anxiety, a, a set of both ethical, uh, sorry, a, a set of ethical and I think anxious concerns around realism. 
real, you know, and we've heard these before, right? With the coming of cinema, all the fears about misapprehending what's on the screen for the real. Rudolf Arnheim's 1935 essay on TV is just brilliant in this regard. The, the fear of TV and realism on TV for helping us believe what, you know, we'll believe what we see, uh, the kind of superficiality and sensation of it all. Um, these are well-worn critiques in the realism domain and, and VR, they're all back on the table. But the third domain, and I think that's the really intriguing one, has to do with recursiveness. Mm. And recursiveness has, there's like a slow recursiveness, the, the, the data surveillance, the, our data is tracked and is fed back to us in the form of what our feed is. But it's the high paced, it's the fast paced recursiveness that's really interesting. And that's the stuff that with foveated rendering and eye trackers, we're going to get a lot more of. Responsive environments, worlds that are responding to our bio trackers, um, to, to the data that we're putting in on a, on a real time basis. That's a really terrifying prospect. It's quite different from what any other kind of media experiences we've, we've had or theoretical frames that we have in the world of media. I appreciate Kent bringing up like looking at other domains for this, for example, therapy. And, and I guess my question to you is like, what, what, what have you guys been thinking about as a frame of reference to deal with, with this recursive domain of, uh, of, of challenges where the system is feeding back in real time to us? You know, the slow one, yeah. we, we have a discourse on that through surveillance mm -hmm. and privacy. Mm -hmm. The fast one is trickier. Mm -hmm. I guess, although I would say, um, and I guess, Yes, uh, thinking about the whole business of media effects and the long history of kind of moral panics about media effects, you know, anxiety about media effects. I guess, I guess, I kind of come from a position where I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm ready to hear my colleagues in other disciplines and the concerns they raise. Um, which I think have a slightly different tenor to me than some of the things one might get kind of in the press. You know, that those concerns about realism in cinema or, you know, um, were probably popular anxieties. And I don't feel there's a, an equivalence with the, with the concerns that people like Thomas Metzinger are, are raising. Um, so I would say that about the kind of history of history of anxiety about realism and hyperrealism. And I guess I, 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 I share your... Uh, thought that the recursive environment is the wholly novel thing, you know, that we have no uh, media literacy <laughs> uh, to draw on as we think about that, um, you know, and it, and it certainly makes me kind of, you know, think about the work of somebody like Sherry Turkle, you know, and her, you know, she talks about us being at this, this, she calls it the robotic moment, and it's not just about robots, but it's this idea that, you know, philosophically, we seem to be inclined and and willing to to you know to talk to ourselves to you know to um you know her, her whole idea about being alone together with technology that so there's something particular about this historical moment and our our willingness to you know to turn to machines um so i you know so i i think i think you're absolutely right that it's the recursiveness that's the that's the the wholly novel factor um and uh, you know, it's it's a conversation we're going to continue having, and I think it's a super super interesting one, but also one that I think does concern me. And I think, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Just a, a quick thought on that, which is that um, when you look at the power of VR to be able to use for training, so you're able to put people into an experience and able to actually do the actions and the motion where they're invoking all these affordances of like embodied cognition, so that you are putting these sort of ideas and theories into action. And so as your body is moving, you actually remember it more. So what's it mean when you take the affordances of embodied cognition and then apply it within the context of a simulation where you're trying to put forth a certain, you know, a sense of rhetoric or a, an argument that you're trying to make. Um, this is gets into the issue of how accurate is the simulation that you're creating to match with reality. And that, you know, you have in the context of training, you have a way to kind of measure that. But here, when you talk about like experiential warfare, where you're trying to like put forth a certain argument where maybe there's a, a pretty significant deviation from the degree in which the simulation that people are going to are actually kind of like teaching them bad concepts or bad ideas. And so uh, it gets into more of this larger issue, which is like trying to simulate reality and then how accurate is that simulation and what are the, the side effects of giving people a simulation that are deliberately trying to send them down a wrong path. 
Although I'm not so sure that matching reality is something that's of concern in documentary, but I, I guess I think I, 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 you know, I'm drawing on this kind of idea that there can be a psychological realism within a VR environment that may have nothing to do with the, the simulation of a, an environment outside VR, but that that psychological realism has a power in itself. Um, uh, I mean, I think it's interesting you mentioning training, and I do think this kind of drift between between different domains of VR, you know, is something that, again, I think is something that documentarists need to be alert to. Um, you know, drawing ideas from therapeutic applications of VR, which will themselves have been, well, should have been tested through, for example, university research ethics processes, you know? Uh, I think there's a, a concern I have, you know, I think it is a concern, this kind of blurring of boundaries or drifting of approaches from one domain to another. That's one of the kind of, um, uh, I think, interesting things that's going on now. Um, uh, uh, documentary is gonna benefit and is already benefiting from the huge amount of investment in technological development that's going on in some of these other domains, which, um, which are very um, uh, 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 economically kind of strong. You know, we, we, you know, we inherit technologies that have been developed for these other domains, but I think we need to be alert that we're not also borrowing, borrowing ideas from those domains uncritically. There's a bunch of questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to try to bring in a few of those. Um, there's um, some questions for solutions, too. So Elaine DeFalco says, given this convergence between Oculus and Facebook, what are reasonable, affordable alternatives for those who want to consume VR media without having to sign away some privacy to continue uh, using the Oculus Facebook platform? As an aspiring content creator, what are the best channels of distribution, proprietary headsets, et cetera, to get content out to targeted audiences? I think I'm going to hand that one right over to Kent. <laughs> Kent sure, where's, yeah. the fair, where's the fair trade VR uh, headset? So this is sort of uh, an emerging discussion, uh, certainly within the XR industry, the sort of antitrust context within uh, the lack of antitrust enforcement, I should say, within U.S. has created like a handful of major, major players. Uh, and there's folks like Microsoft that seem to be on the right side of a lot of that. Um, Valve doesn't necessarily, you know, they're kind of chaotic neutral, as it were. They're not saying doing anything good or bad. They're just kind of like uh, they're providing an alternative, but not sort of taking strong stances on any of this stuff. Apple um, is rumored to be have working on VR headsets as well. So they've traditionally taken a strong stance on privacy, but to me, there's open questions as to whether or not they're just doing that to be able to have complete control over what they want rather than to have any sort of inherent interest in privacy as a, as a concept independent of them sort of maintaining control of everything that they're doing. Um, in Facebook, you know, obviously there's the Quest One, which if you already owned uh, before this time, if you're buying a new headset, you have no other option than to a associate a social media account to any headset that uh, from this point forward, uh, Oculus puts, for, uh, puts out, which is going to be the Oculus Quest 2. Um, so in terms of standalone headsets, I think that's, you know, there's the PC VR, you have plenty of alternatives with the Vive, you know, the HP Reverb is going to be coming out. Um, and so, uh, you know, in terms of like having a certain level of quality, but in terms of standalone, we have like the Pico uh, and other, there's a whole lot of different VR headsets from China that never even leave China. Uh, so that's like an entirely different ecosystem. My best hope would be to look to see it's, if maybe Microsoft uses some of their uh, technologies that they're integrating on the HP Reverb to do that inside out tracking. Um, so it, it's kind of a wait and see, uh, but there is like a lot of ethical implications of uh, having everything you do be recorded and associated with your social media account that is actually going out there and recording what you're doing off of Facebook. It's like this giant surveillance capitalism machine that is you're, you're kind of consenting to. And so what happens to that data? To what degree can they look at what you're doing? They have a roadmap where they're going to have brain control interfaces uh, within the next three to five years, which means that they're going to be able to literally read your thoughts. So what's it mean to be able to be wearing a headset where they can read your thoughts? So that's the trajectory of where we're going. Um, and I think there's a great concern in terms of where that data are going and what they're doing with it. And um, I think it's really important to have 
viable competition, but that's really hard in this sort of uh, lack of antitrust enforcement of these big major tech companies who have these monopolies on each of these different disciplines and, and, and uh, industry verticals. So it's sort of a, we're in a very tight spot. Um, so it's, it's like support the alternatives wherever you can, uh, but there's a trade-off between, you know, taking the best of technology, which is what the Aquas Quest is, versus something that's not as good, but has a little bit more autonomy and control. As there's more uh, success within that market, then there will be competitors that come in. That's just the market dynamic. Uh, so in some sense, there's like, make sure it's successful, but not too successful because we don't want their control to be too much. And so that's sort of my take on that. There's a question here from Bill Nichols. Has anyone examined, examined the potential parallels between VR experiences and those used in enhanced interrogation? Uh, I wish I, I wish I'd shown you. <laughs> I meant to show at least a still from um, this wonderful project called Porton Down, which um, was made by a, a British uh, producer, Callum Cooper. Uh, showed up Sheffield Dockfest a couple of years ago, and it's in a, and it's um, it's a it's an account of the experience of a man who was. Um, who, who volunteered as a, a British soldier back in the 50s to go to Porton Down, which is a medical, um, a military um, scientific unit. And he was subjected to, um, uh, he, the, him and his uh, uh, um, fellow soldiers were given LSD without being told they were given LSD and then subjected to a, a barrage of tests. So the Porton Down VR project subjects you as, a, as somebody within a VR experience to a barrage of tests. Well, meanwhile, I mean, uh, you know, uh, 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 an animated nurse kind of comes in or science, science assistant comes in and, and asks you questions. And meanwhile, you know, you're subjected to more and more intense um, uh, uh, audio and visual kind of stimuli and you can't respond adequately to her questions. So, I mean, it's not quite the answer to your question, Bill, but, you know, there's, there's, there's you know, there are people who are reflecting on VR as that kind of space. Um, the kind of dangers of um, uh, of um, uh, kind of being a being a subject in that space um, and the challenges there. Um, so yeah, I don't know if have you come across anything, William? Uh, uh, so nothing that's on the public record, no. But uh, Brent Leonard, the director of Lawnmower Man, did mention in a panel discussion that he has had private discussions with people within the government who are indeed looking at things like this. Um, and also I would point to what could be happening in China and re-education camps, uh, the use of VR to be able to like do, like, are you uh, loyal to the communist party and to sort of like take the different types of biometric data that you're radiating to see if there's levels to sort of capture micro expressions or deception detection and to be able to like feed that into like a, uh, using VR as a torture device. Um, I do suspect that that is happening, it's just anybody that's doing that is not talking about it. So uh, we can kind of look at the literature of what has what we know about the technology and kind of extrapolate from there. Uh, but beyond that, uh, there's nobody that's talked about any of that on the record yet. At least I've found. All right, here's a question from Andrea Kim. Uh, the concerns about long-term psychological impacts of immersion reminds me of the South Korean TV show in which a deceased seven-year-old girl is reconstructed by 3D modeling as her mother reunites with her in VR. There seemed to be a split between global and Korean audiences, some finding it emotionally cathartic and others finding it concerning. How can we account for cultural specificities in VR reception? For instance, diverse perspectives on encountering the dead. And how much do you think social perceptions of VR as a technology play a role in, in this? Um, well, I would think that both things are at play. Um, I haven't seen the Korean video, although I've read about it, and this kind of idea of virtual resurrection is certainly one of the one of the kind of um, uh, emerging, you know, emerging um, 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 applications of, of of VR. You know, that will not be a one-off, and um, 
so I, I I would I would just say you know as in any media and reception studies will 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 you know show us this you know um, in, in, in all sorts of reception studies I think have reflected on this that you know the the um, media is something to which we are extremely culturally we respond in culturally specific ways and diverse ways and um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I consider that a kind of um, uh, essential part of how we how I understand media, um, and I, I don't know yet of any uh, cross cultural studies of VR, and I'd be super interested to hear about any if people do know of them. Yeah. Yeah, one just quick thought on that is that uh, right now the VR industry is so small that anybody that is producing any piece, there's this pressure to like have English uh, subtitles or anything that are even potentially even dubbed over into English. Um, and so like, like reading subtitles within VR is something that is there, but it's not perfect. And so you sort of like it can break immersion. I mean, I think it's important to have that, but that's like a consideration there when um, there's sort of like a deeper market pressure to be able to translate everything into English. And so uh, my concern is that when you do that, then you lose a lot of the cultural nuances for these different cultures. Uh, if it's always sort of going back to like one single language that um, is, you know, the medium, it, it sort of, you lose different nuances of cultural transmission in that way. Uh, but I do think that uh, it comes back to diversity and inclusion in terms of just trying to be as diverse and inclusive as we can of putting out as many different perspectives as we can uh, and making sure that there's not like one, you know, dominant culture that is dictating what is acceptable and not acceptable. But, you know, and I think when you go to film festivals, you start to see that like just fusion, but I don't see it as much when I like am just looking on the Aqua store. So there's a bit of the curation strategies of these big major tech companies that end up being the filter uh, of the distribution of those alternative perspectives. And you know, if they're not being distributed, then you can't cultivate that audience. And so, you know, that's some of the other dynamics of that. All right. So here's a more specific question about your research methodology from Anchor Bora. How did you choose the households? Um, that were taken for sampling during your research in the UK? What was the process? Did you consider age um, addresses during your research? Yeah, we did. I mean, we were, we were, were broadly concerned with uh, diversity, demographically, socioeconomically. Um, we looked for volunteers. It was a process through which we invited people to volunteer. We were, we were aware of how um, limited many people's uh, knowledge of VR would be. So we held a couple of um, uh, experience days, uh, one in a, um, a uh, community center in South Bristol, um, one um, at a day center for refugee women in Bristol, one at the science center in the heart of the city. So, so it was a combination of, you know, inviting people uh, to volunteer, um, giving people a chance to try VR so they had a sense of what would be involved and keeping an eye on the diversity within the group that was emerging. Yeah. All right, it's 1.28. We only have time for one more question. There's a lot of questions here, which I'll send to you after. Um, so this is from Salim Khan. Uh, he says, in my talks and work, with news organizations, technology makers, and conferences since 2011. I've been talking about the need for foundational ethics to help avoid foreseeable and unknown negative impacts of VRER. With the exception of journalists working directly on creating immersive and spatial experiences, I've found a lack of interest and even dismissiveness about ethics. It's been frustrating. What is your sense and outlook of interest and responsiveness to starting platforms and experience development from within an ethics perspective? Is this being seriously engaged or is it seen as something for end creators to deal with as one technologist said to me? Well, uh, Salim, I'm, I'm with you on its importance. <laughs> and, you know, I, I mean, I, I have nothing other than anecdotal evidence really here um, of, the, of the group of people who were very keen to come to the workshop we held last November in London of 
the number of people who may be here today, which looks like quite a healthy number, given the number of comments I can see in the chat. So I really don't have, you know, anything more than that anecdotal evidence and the wish that that this um, conversation we've started here today, we can we can take forward. So, um, you know, I, I, I haven't quite got a suggestion of how, you know, we do kind of gather up names, but perhaps we can discuss that afterwards, Sarah, in terms of how we might capture, uh, you know, if people want to sort of pop a note in the chat, if they are keen to be in a continuing conversation in this area, I'd be keen to hear from you. Yeah, and I'll just say that um, this discussion is happening and there are more and more groups that are coming together. I mentioned the IEEE Ethically Aligned Design. Um, so the Standards Association, they're going to be having a new industry connections group that is going to be bringing together people from all sorts of different disciplines and domains uh, of the XR industry to be able to talk about this issue of ethics in XR. Um, it's a huge topic um, and, and, and it's not going to be something that any one person from any one discipline or domain is going to be able to tackle. So it's really going to take this interdisciplinary collaboration. So from wherever lens and perspective that you have, then keep an eye on that, uh, out on that. Um, I'll be tweeting about it on my uh, Twitter page at Kent Buy if you have no other place to look for that since it's, uh, it hasn't been announced yet. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think there are people that are thinking and talking about this. Um, I've been featuring them on my podcast and there's discussions there. So it's a conversation that's actively happening. Um, and it's something that is going to continue to happen probably forever because there will always be new ethical transgressions and thresholds that we have to try to figure out. But um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I feel optimistic that this is actually a conversation that is growing, it's not shrinking. There's only more and more ethical and moral dilemmas that are being introduced here in this field. It seems like each day something new uh, pops up, but uh, it's a conversation that is happening and you just have to, I guess, know where to look to, to know where those, those conversations have been happening. And we'll definitely do our part here to keep it going. Um, absolutely. Thank you so much to both of you, to Mandy, um, in particular for your wonderful, amazing research and Kent for joining us today and all that you do. Thank you to everyone for uh, joining us as well and your great questions. We'll be sure to um, continue the conversation. And next week uh, we have um, Thenmazi Samdarajan, uh, who's the executive director of Equality Labs. She's a, a activist, an artist, a, a, a transmedia storyteller, and she'll be with us next week at the same time. So thank you everyone and goodbye.